morning, everybody. I heard something about late uh, nights. <laughs> I, I myself went to bed quite early, so I think I can manage to be uh, the moderator of this uh, session. Um, uh, uh, we were talking about uh, some kind of academic quarter, as we say, in, in Swedish universities, but well, we are a few minutes late, so, so we start now. We will talk about challenges and opportunities in urban planning, and as I understand the program, uh, this uh, kind of discussions will follow uh, after the coffee break, uh, after a while. Uh. And uh, here we have uh, two panelists, uh, Carl Johan Engström and uh, Christer Lindström. We could make it in Swedish, but we <laughs> won't do that. Uh, and uh, Faisola Gundogdu uh, has not arrived uh, from Turkey. Uh, so we have two, uh, two uh, panelists, and uh, I will be the moderator. Uh, and I will start a bit uh, <laughs> from my background, actually. Uh, uh, I'm a board member of the World Society for Acoustics. Uh, actually the youngest board member in this uh, fancy uh, society. Echistics has been called the science of human settlements. Echistiki uh, is obviously Greek, uh, uh, derived from ecos, uh, which has uh, also given us economy and ecology. Uh, ecos is like uh, house, house, family, household, family is actually ecogenia in modern Greek. Uh, it was a very charismatic Greek architect, Konstantinos Doxiadis, who created this science, uh, and he died in 1975. His network uh, of scholars goes back to architects and others uh, from the modern movement uh, of architecture and society as a whole, uh, like Le Corbusier, Gunnar Asplund, Pierre Luigi Nervi, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, Miss van der Rohe, Walter Gropius, Sean Gottman, Arnold Toynbee, Margaret Mead, Lady Barbara Ward, René Dubois, Ken Sotange, ba uh, Buckminster Fuller, uh, uh, Walter Kistaller, Torsten Hägerstrand, etc. etc. Fantastic names. Ooh, I know them all, <laughs> almost, <laughs> from my scholar time. Um, Doxiaris uh, created a comprehensive anthropocosmos man model, uh, uh, sort of the man made world. Uh, for all our planning activities. Uh, he was an uh, active uh, supporter of the first uh, the UN Environment uh, Conference here in, Sto uh, in Stockholm, 1972, and uh, actually the creator of the UN Habitat Conferences. This first uh, one was in Vancouver. Uh, the, uh, the most famous set of elements in, in uh, his uh, science, uh, or in this science of structural planning, is nature, man, society, shells, and what do we have more? What we are talking about? Networks. These are the basic elements of, of the structured planning of all the world, sort of. He was a world planner. <laughs> world architect. He has made town plans for Islamabad, uh, what uh, do we have, Khartoum, and Recife uh, in Bra Bra uh, Brasilia. Uh, so in this conference we uh, focus on networks, clearly. In the Acoustics Board we are about to launch a globally accepted educational program for Acoustics this, uh, this autumn. In, we will be in uh, Athens and, uh, and in, in India. I have no time to go to India. <laughs> uh, I would like to... Uh, to, uh, to I, I would like the panelists uh, maybe to uh, think how you relate uh, uh, our podcast discussion uh, to, the, uh, to the, these artistic elements and of course to, to networks. Uh, so this uh, would be my challenge uh, to my my uh, my panelists, and uh, uh, we now I just now call on uh, Carl Johan Engström. He uh, is a professor at the Royal Institute of Technology in Regional Development, 
uh, since many years, uh, and for many years also he has been the director of strategic planning in uh, Uppsala, our fourth largest uh, commune, uh, uh, population-wise. Uh, and uh, he has been very active in uh, our network Compass, and he has a lot to say both about podcasts and planning, I think. We welcome Carl Johan. So thank you very much for inviting me. Since I left Uppsala one year ago, I haven't been concretely in, involved in PRT projects, but uh, in my job as a professor, I have been very much engaged in regional development and urban structures. And I think uh, this uh, speech will be more about the general trends and how to meet them with the uh, urban mobility systems and the PRT as such. So I will start in another perspective why the urban environment is so important for attractive new in innovation and uh, giving more growth in, in, in a coming green economy. That's the starting point. <coughs> uh, and uh, if you look uh, to, the, to the global world and uh, some studies done uh, around it, there is <coughs> lots of studies done in, in the EU context and uh, there is a special organization called ESPON, European Spatial Planning Observatory Network, the first network discuss around a lot of researchers around uh, uh, the whole of EU looking into the urban development. And they made a trend scenario uh, last year. There is some of the main trends they have focused in, in the European context. There is an obvious concentration to metropolitan areas. Uh, where most of the innovation is created, in fact. But there is also successful economies in some other smaller regions, and uh, mostly around very specialized areas. There is a great change of uh, transport and settlement uh, structures and behaviors, and I think uh, there is sign of that uh, urban sprawl is coming to an end. Not completely, but in many <coughs> regions you could experience that. There is also a big challenge around the uh, aging population. That means uh, a very important challenge to, to transport systems. So what are EU doing when they are not talking about uh, the euro? I think one of the main uh, subjects is a focus on place-based policies. Every region has to stick to its own and find their best way of developing uh, furthermore. And uh, that means that you have to look into the region's potentials and one very, very important potential is how the urban structure is developing. A strong focus on innovation to make a, a, a way of mitigate the disparities. And of course, a green growth to reconcile environment and growth at the same time. A couple of years ago, I was uh, engaged in a project uh, around the central part of the Baltic Sea, and we have the same sort of experience. Uh, earlier than this trend scenario. We could uh, experience the <coughs> concentration of higher business uh, services to capital regions and uh, also to independent centers based on local embedded knowledge. And from my experience in Uppsala, the city of Uppsala belongs to both those two things, which is, is a very lucky situ situation, of course. 
in my research we have have a long term look into the change of the urban areas and we could see a tremendous change after the Swedish uh, economic crisis in the beginning of the 1990s. Uh, it was uh, very much a Swedish one, but uh, it was a, a, a big step towards the more you know, information and knowledge intensive uh, uh, business development in Sweden. So if you look at these uh, pictures, you could see in the mid of the 1990s, 1995, uh, in each of these uh, curves, there is a, a, a clear break when things are going much faster, and that's always service, uh, the service sector. One uh, important part of this is the knowledge intensive business services that are focusing on helping new businesses into, into an economic growth. There's lots of consultants in it, but also other sorts of experts. But there are also a lot of smaller firms focusing on individual and uh, private services. And they are growing quite fast in city centers. And of course, the city centers are places for experience-oriented growth. So if we take the acoustic look of this, we could see the long-term development is that cities has been small, accessible through water systems or by rail systems up to the Second World War. The city itself is built up upon a growth where people could meet each other in the city. But after this period in the beginning of the 1950s, 1960s, the car came into, into the cities and was the bigger and the strongest uh, way of developing cities. And accessibility went from being a, a distance factor to a time factor. And we could see that uh, cities exploded in one uh, single functional areas uh, in a network, but uh, a very special network that needed more and more car traffic. Uh, a reflection is that the car hasn't been a creator of cities, it has been the change of cities. Today we could experience that uh, the trends towards the inner part of the cities is linked to regional uh, enlargement processes where the labor market around bigger cities is growing uh, further and further away and that is dependent on, on uh, rail systems. So this is another way of looking at uh, networks. Uh, in a regional development uh, scenario it's not the whole region that is developing, it's the, the nodes in the networks and that's normally the historical uh, part of the cities. So post-war development, uh, mement, urban sprawl, but, but the information age development means towns in networks. And that is an enormous challenge for further city development because Still, the accessibility factor is, uh, is the main uh, uh, factor for development. But uh, the challenge for sustainability means that you, can't, uh, uh, you have to make this in a way that is climate uh, neutral and, uh, of course, social and uh, cultural uh, profitable. And that means that attractiveness is a key factor for, for cities uh, to find uh, their way of attracting uh, new uh, businesses and uh, firms. And that means that re regeneration has to both access the, 
cultural assets in the cities and the need in the new sector for accessibility. That means that public space is more and more important. You could say that many cities have been uh, focusing on the architectural view of the city, not the public space in between the buildings. So there is evident connections between innovations and, and urban characteristics. And that means that, as we saw from the EU trend scenarios, that the innovation processes are strongest in the metropolitan areas. That has the most open-minded uh, way of looking to the rest of the world, to the globalizations. But uh, to, to attract uh, new development, you need a region that is uh, of interest for, for new settlements and new uh, firms. That means a sort of regional competition that is uh, promoted by the EU policies today. Of course, uh, attraction is not only a, a, a physical factor, it's a, is very much an economic factor and also social and cultural uh, factors. And there has been very interesting studies done in European universities on the basics of, of urban development. And uh, there are five surroundings that has been more successful for new innovations than others. There is knowledge basis, that's the same as university areas, where very much new research is, is promoted. Creative sites, that means uh, science parks and that sort of planned areas for new development. But also, a very interesting new situation is that uh, downtown areas of the cities are innovative areas as well. And a growing part of the innovation is settled here. Then there is spaces of the creative precariat. Uh, artists and other innovative persons with low income and so on. And they also use uncharted urban areas that we think are being to be demolished for more uh, modern structures, but th there's a problem in that, of course. So, if you go to innovation research, you could look to the finance uh, processes that is needed. I don't want to go into depth in that. You start with the research and education, and that goes to ideas, that goes to patents, and so on, and up to growth companies. And uh, today, the seed financing is one of the biggest problems. But also, to go from research to be entrepreneurs is not an easy task. And therefore, there is lots of new programs and uh, incubator uh, programs that means that take care of those innovative persons and make, them pos make it possible for them to be entrepreneurs. But uh, if we look to the uh, creative city uh, aspect of it, you could see how much the municipalities could do for being part of promoting innovations, from having a good uh, basic education up to uh, the creation of, uh, of an attractive city based on cultural heritage, but also on modern accessibilities. So, a breeding ground for development of new ideas and knowledge comes with brilliant, motivated people and their creativity and giving the possibility to, to sprout. That's uh, something that was said many, many years ago from a scientist in, in Uppsala. Linnaeus is called. <laughs> Summing up trends, <coughs> urban areas and their qualities matters. I don't think the economic sciences has uh, been 
focused on this issue, so it's for us to make it understandable. An urban characteristic is the continuity, that's a sort of, uh, instead of urban sprawl, continuity is, is a sort of network, of course. There is uh, clusters and the multifunctional areas being built up. I think that's a, a key issue. You are not living in, uh, in monocultural uh, situations. And the nukes and corridors are, are um, of course, important for this development. But uh, as we could experience more and more activities and more and more uh, residents living in the city centers, it creates lots of more traffic. And that's uh, a, a key dilemma, I think. So, the ultimate challenge to find an urban transport system that faced the, need, the dual needs of attractiveness and efficient mobility. And I think that's the key issue for conferences like this one. Don't go to the technology first, go to the urban trends and see how you could fit into them. No traditional public transport system represents a credible solution for this. Bus systems are not compatible. Uh, uh, subways are for very big cities. Trams are coming, but uh, it's a very expensive way of dealing with mobility. So there is an urgent need of new approaches, and uh, they have to be focused on user-friendly demands on demands how to integrate to, inter to existing infrastructure and demands how to adapt to urban cultural assets and planned urban uh, development. And key factors for this is innovative procurement processes. I think uh, the EU has been a, a hindrance for this, at least if uh, Swedish uh, bureaucrats has to to work with with the uh, procurement processes. And uh, the key factor is, of course, a more transparent planning process that could convince people of uh, new technologies. That's a big hindrance, as I see it. In uh, many studies done in the Royal Institute of, of Technology, we have found a model based on research from, from Pepsi Healy in, in, in Great Britain, built upon these three key words, Forum Arena Court. And Forum means a free place, a free square, where you could be meeting without any uh, agenda. You start open-minded, and you have to find the relevant context for the further further planning work, and you have to create, create legitimacy for this. And the last word is very important. You can't get legitimacy through a decision, you have to gain it. And in the arena, there is the organized meeting, where you have uh, settled partnerships for the further process. You have agreed to some objectives to, to drive the further planning processes. And you have made strategic choices that can't be undone. And often the official planning process starts in the arena uh, stage, and that's too late to get people involved in a, in a true way. And of course, the court is the decision-making part of the process, the legal force for a detailed development plan and for different agreements between partners. But uh, there is too little done for the further implementation process. I think that is a key factor too. The legal force and the way of implementing is not the same thing. So we have to need shape a relevant context in the beginning and, and use cross-sectoral perspectives. 
We have to make the strategic choices and find partners on vertical levels as between the municipality and the region and the nation and in horizontal ways to find partners, <coughs> private partners and, and other partners in the region, in the city. That's the horizontal perspective. And in the pl implementation process with new innovations, I think it's needed to have a strong national support, otherwise the risk management is too, too uncertain. So, postmodern planning is convincing storytelling, not uh, uh, a way of taking technological issues further and further. That's of course a part of it. In Compass, we have been working with approaching ordinary citizens in, in an innovative way, I think. That's a very big step and in many places uh, you can't find that sort of discussion between ordinary people and uh, those developing new technologies. main objections towards uh, PRT systems. I think uh, there is a discussion that uh, PRT could be a main system for town. I think this is a way of approaching the problem in a false way. You can't start to convince people to have a total system for a whole city when you haven't proved that it is working partly. So this is not a, a way of uh, convincing people that uh, the system is relevant for as the main transport or the main urban transport system. And we have to to approach the impact on townscape and cultural assets. I think that could be much more easy than we think it is because if you look to what uh, the car has done to our cities, this is a tremendous uh, spoil of uh, cultural assets and of uh, public space. So start to look uh, to the reality and see which sort of bad urban development has been done and how little attractive this is for further development. The challenge for PRT is not to copy traditional solutions. I think we have made that mistake in many places. We have started to find uh, the same sort of structures for PRT as for buses or trends. But instead, I think we should uh, focus on innovative in integrated solutions, perhaps into the buildings as directly. I think we will have uh, examples on that further on this morning. And uh, the capacity for public transport in bigger cities. I think that also is a way of, uh, of looking too narrow to the problem. All transport systems have capacity problems in rush hours. I think we have to stick to that and not looking into the say, basics of the transport system. There's lots of ways of increased capacity in PRT system. You could uh, have lower speeds in bottlenecks. We, you could have uh, sm smaller time space between the podcasts. But you could also integrate bigger podcasts in the same system. And that means that there's lots of ways of building capacity that is not uh, uh, on the agenda or as it should be. <coughs> then the coverage is of course very important. If you look to capacity, it's not only the way of being transport on the network, it's coming from door to door. And uh, in Uppsala, we made a comparative study between tram and bus uh, on one side and PRT on the other. And if you have 400 meters walking distance to hubs and nodes, there is uh, 
at least 10% uh, better coverage in, with the same sort of in, investment in, in both systems. And that is going from two-thirds to three-fourths, uh, and that I think is a, a very big step. Uh, and the coverage is, of course, very important to, with an aging population. So, to conclude this uh, approach, I think that we have to look into the ultimate challenge. Sustainable urban development has to be uh, reality. And uh, PRT is an innovation that meets many of the new mobility <coughs> demands and uh, in the information society and in a sustainable way. So, I think that's the reason enough to have a real try. Thank you very much.